This is BBC Radio 3 on 90 to 92 FM and on digital. It's 12.15 and in today's music feature, Lewis Foreman delves into the history of one British record label in particular, telling the Lyriter story. <laughs> When I was a kid growing up, we all laughed about Parry and Stanford, who were the only composers pre-1920s, let's say, apart from Elgar, that we knew about, and we all thought they wrote very bad church music. We didn't know anything of the rest, rest of their repertoire at all, and Richard turned up, Richard Litter turned up, with this endless sort of pot of extraordinary, wonderful music. He's a very shy man, very quiet man, but he's passionate about this music, and he really knows about it from having listened to it all his life, and he's made it his mission to make sure this music is not forgotten. And it's a quite extraordinary achievement. Nicholas Braithwaite, one of the conductors most associated with the Lyrita recorded edition, the brainchild of Richard Itter, famous for its exploration of unrecorded British music in top quality sound, the label that had composers like Walton, Arthur Bliss, William Alwyn and Malcolm Arnold conducting their own music that recorded Sir Adrian Bolt when nobody else wanted to and gave a 21-year-old cellist called Yo-Yo Ma his first recording opportunity, playing Finzi. With the complete Lyrita catalogue now coming out for the first time on CD, including recordings never previously issued, I visited Richard Itter at his country home to find the man behind the vision. I had a very musical family, so I grew up with music in the house all the time. I suppose I didn't come across records till I was about four, but I was hooked on records for the rest of my life. So I loved records and I loved music. I, I formed a gramophone club at school. I was never going to be a practising musician. I was supposed to be having piano lessons, but my music teacher at Bishop Stortford College realised that it was useless trying to teach me. So he would play a record and we would discuss it afterwards. And when did you actually start recording music? Well, I had two uncles who had record shops, one of whom was recording back in the 1930s. Nature, himself singing and those sort of things. But he was cutting discs? Yes, which was pretty unique then. I started late 40s, early 50s, private recordings with local students and amateurs, live concerts, recitals, church services, oratorios, operas, <laughs> musicals even jazz, and those were mostly done on disc and then copied on to discs which I sold to the participants. Okay. 78 in those days. I wasn't starting Lyrita from scratch. I had got quite a lot of knowledge and practical experience. I was appalled at how many bad records there were and how many things you couldn't get on records. When I started making them myself, I soon discovered the hard way why there were so many bad ones, realising how difficult it was. So that became an objective, try and get them as good a sound as possible. And time and time again, I would hear something on the BBC or at a concert, go out to buy a record of it. And no, it just wasn't available. When I started it, I was just keen on filling any gaps in the catalogue. Hindemith, McDowell, Poulon, Brazilian stuff. I mean, I wanted to record things that I'd heard and very often by the people I'd heard playing them on the wireless. And more and more often this was British music. And I began to think, hey, we've got a heritage. What are we doing about it? Then I started looking at, do you remember Worm, the World Encyclopedia of Recording Music? And there was practically nothing there. And I thought, this is crazy. I must try and do something. It was really a question of, I suppose, just being lucky to find something that I really wanted to do. And it took over. The more you do, the more you unearth. I mean, I'm staggered. Do other countries have the, the wealth of musical heritage that we have and ignore it? This is the very first Lyrita LP, issued in 1959. And there was something else rather special about it, too. I wanted to do the piano sonata by Gordon Jacob, which I'd heard on the radio, with Iris Loveridge. But it wasn't enough to fill an LP, so I, I, I contacted Gordon Jacob and said, you know, have you got another piece? And he said, no, but I'll write you one. So he did, and it was the elegy.
I learnt later that it was played at his first wife's funeral. So he must have had some feeling for the piece anyway. It's a good piece. The Itter approach was very thorough, including building a splendid music room as a studio, even taking BBC advice on the acoustic, and so the artists on the early recordings all went to the house to make their records. The music of John Ireland, Ireland was still alive, played a big part in Lyrita's early projects, and the complete piano music signalled bold intentions, especially with the composer's recommended pianist, a very young Alan Rowlands. I'd met John Ireland through my piano teacher, Angus Morrison, when I was playing Ireland works at the Royal College of Music, and uh, I went to visit him, and he seemed to like my playing, so I got the benefit of his advice. Sometimes I would have a question of interpretation which I wanted to put to him, and I would play the piece, and then when I came to that place, his mere presence in the room seemed to tell me how to do it, and I didn't actually have to ask him. When he heard that his music was going to be recorded by Lyrita, he recommended me, much to my surprise, I must say. It was all a very new scene to me, as I was still a student at the college, although a, a somewhat older one than normal, because I hadn't gone there till I was 26. There's one letter that he wrote to me. I don't now remember what I'd said to him, but perhaps it was about the difficulty of being absolutely on your toes and giving an immaculate performance under studio conditions. He says here, thank you for your letter and for the immense trouble you have taken with the recordings. I agree fully with what you say as regards this form of hard labour, and I'm sure your recordings will turn out well if Mr Itter knows his job. Well, certainly Mr Itter did know his job. I would take a train from Paddington and he would meet me, bespectacled and mild-mannered, and then he'd introduce me to his sister and his mother, who always provided the most delicious lunches and were very supportive company. The music room was quite a nice room, and the piano was a lovely instrument and he made one feel very at home, although he was at the same time very businesslike and definite about what was wanted and needed. The fee for the first LP was £10, which doesn't seem a lot now and didn't seem very much then. And we did do the first LP without any editing, so they had to be pretty well good takes all the way through. I can remember trying to record Equinox, which is of the order of a concert study, and thinking, I'll never get this right, uh, can I do it? And every time I went back into the studio, feeling like a lamb going to the slaughter. Awful feeling, I don't know why we musicians put ourselves through this, but eventually we did get one that sufficed. Incidentally, the name Lyrita, in case you're wondering, is made up of R-I-T-A from Richard's own name, R Itter, spelled phonetically, with two letters L-Y from his mother's name. Well, now you know. Peter Williams from Stoke-on-Trent. I think it was a record review recommendation. The lyric recording of the Have a Good Brian Sixth Symphony came up, only an excerpt, and I thought, I must have this. It sounds exciting and different. Well, I played it a few times. Well, goodness me, have I made a mistake, because I can't understand this at all. <laughs> but I kept on persisted with it, and I realised just how dramatic and concise it was said so much in such a short time and the recording quality is brilliant I think the sound engineer has done an incredible job everything comes over it all leads up I think to that last shattering climax still send shivers down my spine Radio 3 listener Peter Williams introducing two new departures for Lyrita. Stereo sound, the early recordings were all in mono of course, and the orchestra. By the early 1960s Richard Itter was thinking bigger, 
but independent record labels were still the exception and there were no freelance producers and engineers. So at the time of the Schulte Ring, he went straight to the top. The Decca Record Company, famous for the quality of their sound, their LP pressings and the superb acoustic at their regular orchestral location of London's Kingsway Hall. I wanted to expand and I thought I could. I've always been in love with the orchestra, so I suppose there was a deep-seated thing there that I always wanted to get involved with orchestral music. I mean, I love the thought of, what, 70, 80 people sitting there, all individuals, and then suddenly coming together, making this glorious sound. It gets exciting. Decca had, at that stage, they were making the best recordings in the world, I think. I was a great fan of their sound, so I tried to negotiate with them. It was quite prolonged and difficult. I don't think they were particularly worried about duplication of repertoire because they knew mine was going to be British and apart from Britain they weren't doing much British music. Eventually I got an overall agreement including pressing which I'd had earlier difficulties with, distribution and export, but also recording which was largely going to be subject to their top producer John Carlshaw's final decision. So I went to see him and he said, right, what are, you, what are you planning to do? Well, I'd been sounding people out, and I thought, you know, I've got to impress him if I'm going to get this. So I reeled out my plans for the first five. Provided I got Decker, provided I got Kingsway Hall to record them in, Sir so Bolt and the LPO doing Ireland, two discs, Imogen Holst and the English Chamber Orchestra doing Holst, Del Mar and... Philharmonia doing Back Six, which had been a sensational broadcast. The Birmingham Symphony Orchestra doing Bliss. With Bliss coming along, and the Birmingham Orchestra coming up to London to do it. And I think he was impressed. He said yes. So off we went. When I first went to Kingsway Hall, I stood on the rostrum and I thought, this is where Elgar must have stood. <laughs> Decker not only gave Lyra to the services of people at the peak of their profession, like the engineer Kenneth Wilkinson, but also youngsters who were just starting out, like the producer Andrew Cornell, now executive director of the Royal Liverpool Philharmonic. My first recording for Lyrita was George Lloyd's Eighth Symphony, and that actually started a whole summer of Lyrita recording. I just had a ball that summer. Not only did I discover George Lloyd's music, but I discovered the music of Bridge, the dance poem and the dance rhapsody. And I just was blown away by those pieces, pieces nobody knew, which deserve a place commonly in the repertoire, I think. Very similar to Ravel's La Valse, but precursor by years. Could Ravel have heard Bridge's work? Isn't it interesting to remember that just after the war, a BBC reading panel rejected both the Bridge and the George Lloyd pieces. It's all a matter of the style that's acceptable in a given period. It is taste and it is fashion, isn't it? And I remember talking to George Lloyd about this many times, about his frustration that the blinkers had come on. I think we're now much more eclectic in our view of style, but that didn't help those composers of that era. remember that Richard Itter came into recording this approachable British music at a time when it was badly neglected. The critic, Edward Greenfield. William Glock at the BBC was more or less banning it. There had been, in the early days of LP, a bit of an explosion. Argo, of course, was a wonderful example of it, but in the Glock era, Serial music ruled the roost, and anything connected with tonality was out the window, which was ridiculous. So plenty of my colleagues and friends were 
devoted to buying lyrical recordings because of the repertory. It was very important to fill in that gap. The literature sessions were a bit of a whirlwind. There was a little bit of sense of free song. You're never quite sure what was going to happen. Once or twice I haven't known the piece that we've recorded. The Hurlston's a good example, the Hungarian air variations. I like all his other music, and I think it was Coleridge Taylor said he never wrote an unnecessary note. I got several people's reactions, so I thought, no, let's try it. So there was this piece which I didn't know. And suddenly it started, and the orchestra responded and the life sort of oh gosh it became really vital and I sat there thinking two hours nobody's alive probably who's heard this before hasn't been played for I don't know, 90 years or something and it's lovely and everybody's enjoying it <laughs> orchestras enjoy a change, and so did the conductor, Nicholas Braithwaite. We used to aim to record a full 18 minutes per three-hour session, which is the maximum allowed. And that's very, very hard, even if you know the music. Now, the London orchestras that we did these recordings with had never seen these pieces before in their lives, and they produced the most staggering results. I mean, Hulsen, who is a real favourite of mine, died tragically very young, but glorious pieces. We did that whole CD in about three sessions. That's an extraordinary achievement with such fanciful and free rhapsodic music as that. One of the real challenges of the conductor is that you'd studied it until you blew in the face and you knew it, but you hadn't experienced it. By the time you do a piece for the second and third times, you've got much more understanding of how it works. And what we used to do was we'd rehearse the first part of the session, perhaps an hour, and then record for a quarter of an hour, 20 minutes. And then we'd have the orchestral break and I'd go into the room to listen to the playback. And I'd hear all the things that I was doing that I didn't like so much. <laughs> And then we'd go out and we'd rehearse a few things again. Then we'd do another complete take, probably, which would, in a way, be a little bit like a second performance. And by that time, we'd probably only have about 20 minutes left, so we'd be doing two or three short takes. It was getting a little nearer to recording a live performance, but I think the orchestra liked that better than bits and pieces, as it were. And I suppose we did gloss over some of the minor things because we wanted to get that extra edge of the performance as a whole. I think today's technology is such that there is a tendency to concentrate on the detail with lots and lots of little takes and I think that spoils the performance. Another conductor whose recording career really got going with Lyrita was Vernon Handley. The Lyrita recording sessions could not have taken place without the phenomenal reading power of British orchestras. And also, if I may say so, of several British conductors who were willing to take it on because they believed in the music. The great thing about British orchestral players is that once you make it quite clear that you believe in the music... They are with you to the hilt. I mean, they, they will play at the top of their form. But you must convince them, and you must feel yourself, 
that the composer is absolutely worthwhile and it's a shame he hasn't been recorded by six recording companies before. There are a number of British composers that I've tried to champion. People like Finsey, Bax and McConkey who had something to say that was searching. I suppose it's something to do, of course, with the experience many of them had of the First World War, either their own horror or the horror of their comrades that were killed. These composers ought to be in front of the public the whole time because they have an individual voice. I think one of the lyrical recordings I'm most proud about would be the Intimations of Immortality of Finsey, because I was at the time trying to raise the Guildford Orchestra and the Guildford Choirs to a standard where people were getting representative performances of important but unknown works. And we made an audience there. And of course we had Ian Partridge on that record. He sang that almost ideally. I mean, he taught me so much about the piece. Vernon Handley's mentor, Sir Adrian Bolt, had been in 1965 the first conductor to record for Lyrita. Quite a coup for Richard Itter. He was a conductor of world renown between times, as it were. His EMI contract hadn't been renewed. He was no longer with the BBC. He was a British music fan. He wanted to do more. I don't think he had many doubts. Decker probably removed those doubts because he knew their good reputation. And very often works were included at his suggestion. Warren, Butterworth, Howells, the Bridal March, Perry. That was in somebody's loft and hadn't been played for years and has never been recorded by anyone since. It's a popular piece. Not everything went entirely smoothly with Bolt, though. I remember him at one Lyrita session getting very ratty with a fag-smoking timpani player. But more seriously, at first nobody realised he preferred an orchestral layout with violins divided left and right, and Bolt was too polite to make a fuss, so his first few Lyritas had the violins all sitting together on the left. No sooner was that mix-up sorted out than Lyrita was forced to move from Kingsway Hall to Walthamstow Town Hall for Bolt's most important Lyrita recording, the first ever integral set of both Elgar symphonies. At Walthamstow, the engineers simply couldn't make the balance work with Bolt's and Elgar's preferred arrangement, and the violins all had to sit together again. It certainly upset Bolt, but I think in a way it added just a little edge to the performances. Bolt was frothy at the mouth, so I was obviously influenced in my review because I rather dismissed those Lyrita versions of the Elgar symphonies and now I find that they are superb. They're Bolt's best recordings of the Elgar. As well, now we have four or even five versions of the second symphony which was a work that Elgar himself realised Bolt brought out from neglect in the early 1920s. My name is Carolyn Wingfield. I'm from Saffron Walden. My first Levita Records definitely started a process of discovery because once I found composers on this label, terrific music I'd, I'd not heard of before, it just encouraged me to explore further. One particular favourite, um, partly because the piece was, I think, such a surprise to me, was the Piano Quartet in A Minor by Herbert Howells. I hadn't tended to think of chamber music being written by British 20th century composers to any great extent. And there was this wonderful, fresh, lyrical work, which quite blew me away the first time I heard it, and I still play the record. And I've played it to a number of friends too, and I've always got the same reaction from them.
Yes, we mustn't forget Lyrita's smaller scale recordings. The songs of Gerald Finzi were recorded by Finzi's friends, John Carroll Case and Howard Ferguson, and the complete songs of John Ireland, with Alan Rowlands again as the pianist. I must go down to the sea. For me, the songs are closer to my heart than even the piano music. I think one reaches a quality and an intimacy of Ireland's imagination which is quite unparalleled. I remember how Benjamin Luxton, how very much in sympathy he was, although quite a lot of the music was new to him. And in singing Sea Fever, he looked the epitome of the bluff Cornish sailor with his ruddy cheeks and fair hair. Ireland didn't like sea fever sung too boisterously or jovially, perhaps a little more effectively. And I told Luxon that, and he unfortunately took that to an extreme, so that his performance is highly reflective and, in fact, very slow. And I really got it in the neck from Charlie Marks, who had been one of Ireland's choir boys and knew, knew a lot about what he wanted. He said, you know, you shouldn't have taken that so slowly. And I think he was right, actually. The song that Luxon loved the most was the one to Christina Rossetti's words... When I'm Dead, My Dearest, which is one of Ireland's shortest and most exquisitely simple. Whenever he felt a bit tired and hard-pressed in the recording, he'd say, oh, let's sing that again. So we did that, I think, altogether nine times. In fact, the whole experience of recording those songs was an emotionally racking one. I remember coming out when we'd finished and standing on the steps of St John Smith Square, hardly able to get to grips with the outside world because the experience had been so intense. I was there for most of these sessions, but I was, as I used to put it, part of the team. The producer was in charge. I was what would, I suppose one would call an executive producer. <laughs> well, I landed up very often just making sure that coffee arrived on time and those sort of things. I do wish I had taken music study a bit more seriously. I mean, I had to produce one or two records during the deck of time when um, the original arrangements fell through for some reason or another. And I could just about follow the score, but I desperately needed to know more. I saw them through just about. Richard Itter. Some people probably assumed he was still making all his own recordings personally, because Decker expressly forbade him crediting their producers and engineers on Lyrita LPs. Curiously, it seems that may have helped make the records even better. Edward Greenfield again, then engineer John Dunkley, and producer Andrew Cornell. It was immediately apparent, some of the first issues, that they had extra quality. They were, I thought, superb in the sound, because as they were freed from you know, the bosses back at Decker headquarters, they felt free to experiment and produced the most marvellous results. I think they were even better than the ones they were doing for the parent company itself. That used to make us smile quietly to ourselves, given it was the same people, same venues, etc. I think Richard gave a chance to an awful lot of younger people, and it was a wonderful training ground for both engineer and producer. 
In Decker, unlike some of the other companies, you didn't actually have a, a producer who said, you can't possibly try this. It was a true dialogue. Therefore, within Lyrator, that foundation was already there. And you could actually try out different techniques quietly on many, many different types of repertoire. Decker was doing a lot of third-party work for other companies. Turnabout, most of the RCA discs that were done in Britain were recorded by Decker. But I think Lyrita held a special place because it was dealing with music that was our own music, if you like. And I think the thing for me about working with the Decca engineers I was working with all the time was that you were able to go beyond just getting a great sound, but getting the sound that suited the piece in terms of its internal balance, which I always think was one of the things which made the Lyrita disc sound so good because everybody was creating on those sessions. It wasn't just a, a Brahms symphony or a Beethoven symphony. This was something completely new. So there was a little bit of extra that you would want to find out. There were new textures coming out at you. There were new styles. So I think all the crew worked just that little bit harder to get the right performance, the right sound. most favourite ones would be the Malcolm Arnold dances conducted by Arnold himself. Being fairly young, maybe I put a little more detail into the orchestral sound. I wanted to absolutely balance the horns versus all the brass because of this wonderful writing that Malcolm has. So maybe I overcooked it slightly, but I think it worked. many ways, clarity, definition, transparency, those recordings, the best recordings of the 60s and 70s, are even finer than the latest ones because with the multi-channel techniques and digital recording, they don't have so long to balance the microphones as they did in the old days, and they cut corners. <laughs> I remember when CD came out, I naturally thought that the Lyrita catalogue would be a perfect candidate for CD. OK, a certain edginess of digital recording that you could complain about, but uh, on the whole, the gains were so much greater than the losses. And of course, alas, I, for some extraordinary reason, Richard Itter would not issue the recordings on CD, really blocking the way when we should have had them years ago. Thank goodness we've got them now, or getting them now. I didn't like digital sound when it first came along. I thought it was very inferior to analogue sound. In a way, it was robbed of life. I mean, I don't know anything about digital technology really at all. I regard it simply as a code. The original and what we hear is analogue. The coding, therefore, has got to be as accurate as possible. And I think in the early days it wasn't that accurate. Then they increased, uh, what do they call it, the bit rate or something, and it got a bit better. And now it's increased still more, and I like to think it's better. But it is, to me, only still a code. So I made some mistakes, because after Decker was taken over, the production masters were missing. I had to decide then whether to delete everything or remaster it. And I didn't think CDs were going to take over tomorrow, as it were. I thought it was going to take quite a long time. So I spent most of the 80s remastering for LPs rather than concentrating on CDs, which everyone else was doing. OK, with hindsight, that was a mistake. We could have saved a lot of time and energy and money. Mind you, having said that, the digitization process at that stage was pretty primitive. So I think the end product would have been less good than it turned out to be eventually because by the early 90s when we were doing CDs, the digital process had improved enormously.
John Ford's dynamic triptych from Lyrita's first ever digital recording in 1982. One criticism that's been made of Lyrita is of ignoring the avant-garde. They could be right up to the minute with recordings such as John White's piano sonatas, Malcolm Williamson's organ concerto and Arnold Cook's third symphony. But most of the tougher modern music on Lyrita wasn't originated by the label itself. It was bought or licensed from other sources, including the British Council. I'm Cliff Challenger. I live in Bradford. When I was in my teens, back in the 70s, listening to discs borrowed from the library, it was the recording of um, Nicholas Moore's Centenarius, which is a wonderful piece of music released by Lyrita, coupled with Elizabeth Lutchen's Quincunx. And it was Lyrita who got me listening to some of the other contemporary British composers like Helen Hoddinett, William Mathias, Thea Musgrave, Malcolm Arnold. And it was so wonderful to find out there was so much available. I mean, I love composers like Bach or Beethoven, but I want to hear something that's uh, by people who are still alive, that's still part of my own culture. Richard Itter has never been short on business acumen, but how did he manage to pay for the Lyrita recordings? Richard himself again, and then conductor Nicholas Braithwaite. We did have a rather mean attitude towards things, I suppose, in the sense that we never gave artists royalties. We said, here's something no one else is going to ask you to record, here's what we propose as a fee, that's it. We're taking all the risks, anything that we make after that is ours. It wasn't going to be profit, it was going towards the costs. But we've had very few really bad ones. I mean, most of them have gone a long, long way towards covering their costs. So, um, with the help of the composers' trusts and things, it's it's worked. I think we were largely responsible for the trusts that were evolving at that stage, 70s, 80s, becoming involved in recording. People like the Ireland Trust, the Finzi Trust, the Bridge Trust... They helped subsidise the recordings. The music became better known. The records generated copyright, which went back to the composer's trusts or heirs. So logical. And Richard was preserving this quality music at a time when a lot of the people who should have known better were actually throwing it out into rubbish skips. I mean, when we recorded the Sterndale Bennett Symphony, when the librarian from the orchestra went to the publishers to get the parts a month before the session, they said there is no such piece. Now, we'd booked the parts a year before when they'd said there was a piece, but in the meantime, they'd been taken over or something, and they had trashed the score on the parts. But luckily, that symphony had been published, and as it had been published, the BBC had a set of parts, and we were able to record it. Somebody was telling me the other day that um, one of the movements of the symphony he wrote on the train from Cambridge to London. My name's Ian Gordon and I live in Folkestone. I've always had an interest in English music, but I came to it through a flourishing parish church choir. I came across an article, I think it was in Gramophone magazine, about one of the early records, and suddenly realised, you know, there were all these different uh, British music that I'd only read about in reference books, and here it was, I could actually listen to it. It's just a wonderful heritage. I mean, we talk about our painters and our poets and our, our novelists and writers, but we forget about the musicians. It's such a pity, because there's so much of value there. My favourite, I think, is the Stanford Piano Concerto Number 2. A magical piece. It opens with a terrific flourish on the piano, which I always think is a cross between Brahms and Rachmaninoff, and it just it, and it goes on from there. I've played it to people and called them out. They think it's something European, but there it is, one of our own great composers and a great teacher, of course, Stanford, and this wonderful, wonderful piece. Having been present at quite a number of Lyrita recording sessions over the years, I must say my own favourite has to be the Bach's Second Symphony, 
In 1970, a work I already knew on tape, but a blinding revelation when heard in the hall. What's your current list of things that ought to be recorded? There are reams and reams of things. I have a list a mile long, and I will never see the end of it. Various complications since the 1990s meant a long silence from Lyrita. Now, Thanks to an agreement with the Wyaston estate, the whole catalogue, even the early monos, should be available on CD by Lyrita's 50th anniversary in 2009. Reservations have been expressed by those other companies who recorded the British repertoire while Lyrita was sleeping, and who see this year's tidal wave of Lyrita CDs as producing something of a glut in a specialised area. But there's no doubt of a hugely positive reaction from both critics and public. Like this recording of E.J. Moran's Symphony in G Minor by the New Philharmonia Orchestra, conducted by Sir Adrian Bolt, which one writer said will never have a better performance than this. It feels incredible, actually, the reviews. I couldn't believe, really, they were talking about my records. And of course, there's an awful lot happening. It's one and a half CDs a week. I don't know how I'm going to be able to keep up with that for another year or two. I just wish it could have happened, what, <laughs> ten years earlier. <laughs> I'm sitting in a claim because they've cost me so much money. <laughs> I've bought so many of them, and it fills me full of inspiration. It's like having an anthology of great English poetry. You've got this marvellous collection of great British music. They've opened my ears to a much wider range of British music of the 20th century, which you don't hear in the concert hall. So it's made a big difference to my musical listening and enriched it considerably. It is extraordinary that record collectors are so much more adventurous than concert goers. These are world-class recordings and they are in every library around the world. I get work now from people who were brought up on these recordings in middle America because they thought it was wonderful work. It was pioneering stuff. You always felt it was pioneering stuff that you were doing. And I think it has a great place in British musical history, this label. It was always a great regret to me that it didn't carry on. Of course, other people took its place, Shandos Hyperion. I even did some myself when I was running the Argo label in the 90s. But I don't think anybody went into the repertoire and unearthed the gems that Richard did. And he had great people doing the recordings and the right people for the right repertoire. And I think musicians, composers, historians owe him a great debt. His enthusiasm, his commitment, Maybe in the end is sheer bloody-mindedness, stubbornness to make sure that those things happened. That should go down in musical history, I think. The Lyrita story was presented by Lewis Foreman.